Songs of a Labor Teacher. Between the years 1972 to 74, I was a labor teacher on a railway construction gang in northern BC for six and a half months and at a copper silver mine near Great Bear Lake Northwest Territories for two four-month contracts over one winter. Both crews had around 55 men. During this time, I wrote 17 songs about people and events. I've edited these down to 10. The songs detail derailments and mine accidents, but are mostly about the personal situations in which the men found themselves, estranged from families and loved ones. Both situations were isolated. The rail gang was 60 miles from the nearest community for two separate months, and the miners, 280 miles from the nearest community with the company DC-3, the only transport, stayed on site for the duration of their up to four-month contracts. The rail gang was made up of Dene, Portuguese, and Punjabi laborers, along with others from different parts of Canada. In large part from prairie farms, mine workers were also from such disparate locations as Ireland, Germany, and Australia. It has been a recurring hope of mine to do something with these songs someday. The cathartic effect of writing these songs helped me, as a young man in my early 20s, deal emotionally with different situations I had not encountered before, including the suicides of two rail gang members within three weeks of each other. In the February 16, 2004 issue of Maclean's magazine, one Alison Gibson of Seashelt, British Columbia, wrote the following letter under the heading, The True Toll of Logging. And she wrote... As the wife of a logger, I felt my throat tighten as I read your article, Blood in the Woods, British Columbia, January 19th. The same feeling I got every time I received a quiet word that an accident had occurred and a helicopter was on its way in. My anxiety isn't so immediate now. My husband, like numerous others, can no longer work in the same community in which he lives since access to harvestable timber is so restricted. Depending on the distance these men must commute and the remoteness of where they go, they can be absent from their families for days, weeks, or in my case, months. You might wish to consider logging's social impact on its communities by way of alcoholism, divorce, and the effects of absentee fathers. The danger to a logger and his family isn't only physical, and that was Allison Gibson of Seashell, B.C. in 2004, letter to McLean's. The following reminiscences and songs were written on a railway extra gang in northern B.C. and in a mine near Great Bear Lake, Northwest Territories. Although Miss Gibson was referring to social problems experienced by the men working in isolated logging camps and their families, she could have been speaking about workers at any isolated work camp. Part 1, The Rail Gang. From early February to mid-August of 1972, I worked on the Pacific Great Eastern Railway, spending most of the time in the northern part of BC. During this time, the railway was renamed the British Columbia Railway. I joined Extra Gang number 136 of the PGE at Squamish on the first Friday in February of 1972. We spent two weeks there working on a spur line in the harbour. Following a derailment at Horseshoe Bay, we worked around the clock for 36 hours to clear the line and then spent the next two weeks cleaning up the debris. At this time, the camp was moved to Brunswick. At the end of February, we moved north, overnighting at Prince George and Fort St. James before continuing on to work on a Dease Lake extension. At Fort St. James, we met Ernie, who was joining our gang. I remember he had two long, scabbed-over scratch marks down his cheeks. Ernie was Dene. He had just got out of the prison in Prince George and asked us if we would accept him. When I told him we would beat him up every night after work, he laughed. Ernie worked with us through March at Tromber Lake, which is about 60 miles north of Fort St. James, and 30 miles north of the Dene village of Tachi. Cree further south referred to this area of BC as heaven. 
With the snow-capped mountains, mountain valleys and lakes, and abundant wildlife, it was easy to see why. Ernie made friends with Ram, one of our foremen. I can still see them walking as they passed each other on the track, getting ready to climb aboard the flatbed that took us to work at 7 o'clock each morning. We laid steel north of Trombler Lake. In front of the crane would be men putting ties, catching the rails swung around by the crane, swinging the rails into position end to end with the rail just laid, and connecting them with angle irons, which were bolted through holes drilled in the rails. Behind the crane, men would be putting tie plates, spiking, hauling bridle irons, which spaced the spikeless rails in front of the crane, allowing it to move forward and lining the track. All in all, the gang would be spread out for about half a mile, not counting the tie gang that would be about as far again in front of the crane. For that month, Ernie was one of those men. He left the gang after that march at Trombler. We heard that he was going to get married. We didn't hear much more than that until the long weekend in May. This is Prince of the Nation. He was Prince of the Nation with the whole world at his feet. The rivers were his highways and the forests were his streets. A yard apart of brows broke sweat on recent yesterdays to push the steel on ice and mud far up the Yukon way. His family disowned him for his love could serve no end. To his bride he was a lover and to me he was my friend. To guards who found him Sunday morning hanging in his cell. He's just another carrier who drunk his way to hell. He was prince of the nation with a shovel in his hand. His kingdoms were the bars beneath the snow peaks of his land. A young man with two meanings from which I had to choose. A drunkard I would pass by or a friend I'd come to lose. He was Prince of the nation, may his memory come to rest. I'll forget about the bad times, and I'll think about the rest. After a month in the bush, the gang spent a long weekend in Prince George. We then headed back to north to Trombler Lake for another month. There were three main different nationalities on the gang, Dene, Portuguese, and Punjabi. There were about 15 to 20 men in each group. The rest of the gang, perhaps a dozen, were from different European countries, different Aboriginal groups, or Canadians of European descent, such as myself. Ram, the foreman who had made friends with Ernie, was from the Punjab. This next song is about Ram. The song is called B Call Cannonball. B C O L, I pronounce it B Call in the song, were the letters put on rail cars owned by the British Columbia Railway. The railway would very quickly become to be known as the BCR, but to railway men at this time, BCR on a boxcar meant Burlington Central Railway. Because the British Columbia Railway had just changed its name from the Pacific Great Eastern, and because I was work- on the working end of shovels, hammers, and picks, I figured I could call the railway whatever I wanted. This song was written as the gang moved south from Trombler to Tachi. Be Call Cannonball, or Ram Song. Rolling over steel we might have laid last fall Going down to Fort St. James on a Be Call Cannonball the men like to drink and a woman eyes a gamble if they can. The only law out in the bush is don't make any plans. And the cold north wind blows, melting the summer snow. The engineer says, now look out, boys, we'll have some fun today. The mud was wet, the ties were low, it was the first of May. As the man in the bunk next to mine told me of his crimes, we hit a low spot in the track and jumped that railroad line. And the cold north wind blows, melting the summer snow. 
The fourth time we were on the ground, we limped into 98 for some tatchy men who were real good friends and news that couldn't wait. Rebella Francesca was the first to hear, he said. Foreman Maury and Peter Tom said he killed himself Friday night in Dawson Creek. And the cold north wind blows, melting the summer snow. He pushed us hard right through March when the ground was muddy and wet. He left our gang late last week for his farm near Lillouette. Another man was loving his woman. His wife left him last fall. And we're going down to Fort St. James, and I don't know if we'll get there at all. And we're going down to Fort St. James, and I don't know if we'll get there at all. The next song was written after we had moved south in May and were working out of Fort St. James. The gang would be stretched out along either side of the rails, shoveling gravel into the middle of the track. A man in a tamping machine came behind. The machine would grip the rails, put two feet down on the ground between the ties, lift the rails, and press or tamp the gravel underneath the ties. The Portuguese gang members inspired me to write the song. Along with a muscle on my back, I had pulled, trying to see how far I could carry an iced-over black tie complete with spikes and tie plates. This is called If I Ever See Maria Again. I hit that shovel with my knee. The ache in my back is like a fire. I love a woman I cannot see. I walk the line till I retire. And it's a long aeroplane ride to get to Lisbon on the other side. And if I ever see Maria again, I'll say yes, weren't we good friends? Big Joe has a house in Montreal. Nine months of the year, he's not there at all. He's up with me in North BC, laying steel for the PGE. And it's a long aeroplane ride to get to Lisbon on the other side. And if I ever see Maria again, I'll say yes, weren't we good friends? Manuel works the spiking machine. The boss man rides him. He can be real mean. Manuel does whatever the boss man please. He speaks no English, reads no Portuguese. And it's a long aeroplane ride to get to Lisbon on the other side. And if I ever see Maria again, I'll say yes, weren't we good friends? The first long weekend in Prince George, at the end of March, I had brought a pair of cowboy boots with riding heels. I would learn the hard way the difference between riding heels and walking heels. By June, we had moved back as far north as the Tatchy siding. The gang would be back north of Trombler in July. In June, we had a rare Saturday off, and I hitchhiked the 30 or so miles to Fort St. James to do some shopping. On the way back, a young Denny couple from Tache, returning from the high school graduation, picked me up. I'm walking down the Tache Road, looking for a smile from a car with a load. Try to find a reason for living this way. I'll have to wait till tomorrow, could not find this reason today. I hitched a fort and cowboy riding boots with the hot sun summer high. Played Ram's song at the four mile camp and someone said you got it right. Now I'm hitching in the setting sun, 20 miles back Tatchy Way. And the coyotes howl all around me in the last light of the day. And I'm walking down the Tatchy Road. Looking for a smile from a car without a load. Tried to find a reason for living this way. I'll have to wait till tomorrow. Could not find that reason today. A young man and his girlfriend on their way back from. Holding hands and making plans. 
at the senior prom. Pick me up and drop me off at the fork two miles from home. So I walked in the dark to the bunk cars through the coyote moans. And I'm walking down the tatchy road looking for a smile from a car without a load. Trying to find a reason for living this way. I'll have to wait till tomorrow. Could not find that reason today. Richard Nelson, a Sim Shan from the Prince Rupert area, was another member of the gang. He played guitar and could sing harmony to Simon and Garfunkel's Sounds of Silence. We were playing guitar around a campfire outside the bunk cars one night and came up with this song. It was in G when we sang it. I will sing you a song in G. I will sing you a song in G. And it's down to C and it's up to D and back to G. I will sing you a song in G. I will sing you a song in G. And it's down to C and it's up to D and back to G. Time's too short when you're with good friends. So I'll sing you this song until then. I will sing you a song in G. I will sing you a song in G. And it's down to C and it's up to D and back to G. I will sing you a song in G. I will sing you a song in G. And it's down to C and it's up to D and back to G. Richard was a good friend. If I worried out loud about being killed by a swinging rail, he would quickly inquire, Can I have your boots? When the first bulldozer cat belonging to the railway appeared on Denny Land, Augustine Joseph of Tatchy had taken his rifle and bounced a couple of rounds off the bulldozer's blade. He had spent a couple of years in prison for that. I met Augustine at the bar in Fort St. James. I bought him a beer, and he told me this story. Supposedly, the longtime premier of BC, W.A.C. Bennett, was at a banquet given in a native village. He was seated at the head table next to the chief. Premier Bennett barely touched his food, mostly just picking at it and moving it around on his plate. The chief, on the other hand, cleared off his plate, had seconds, and then had dessert and coffee too. Finally, Bennett turned to the chief and said, Chief, I wish I had your appetite. To this, the chief replied, Mr. Premier, you've stolen our land, taken our resources, killed our animals, raped our women, and now you want my appetite. The Dees Lake extension was later abandoned about 200 miles short of Dees Lake. Logging roads around the coast had got to the same place, so there wasn't any need for it anymore. I left the railway in mid-August of 1973 and went back to school. From October of 1973 to July of 1974, I worked at Terra Mines, Campsell River, Northwest Territories. The mine was isolated and alcohol-free. Some men would go there to make a lot of money, some to get away from booze, some both. Stopes ran horizontally from raises, which in turn rose vertically from drifts. The main drift was about 12 feet by 12 feet and curled around in a 17-degree downward spiral from the portal door at the surface to the bottom of the mine. In the winter of 73 to 74, the main drift was about a mile in length. The Grudigs were drift miners. They were highballers three brothers who worked in the mines in the winter to get money to invest in their farms. One evening, one of the brothers came into the rec hall, a rare occurrence, grabbed a coffee, and spoke his mind. Long, cold, lonely nights. We looked all over Saskatchewan to find a place where the sun don't shine. Our last note came in the office of the Esther Hazy Potash Mine. Now they sure don't like the hard rock types because we're a rough and tumble crew. 
So we hit the great northwest again. A man does what he must do. And I've been miners told by the face he keeps in the long, cold, lonely nights. And his woman's told by the tears she weeps in the long, cold, lonely nights. Brought up to believe in hard work and a simple love that's true. We went to school but did not learn the things you seem to. Now years pass away, we find today it's a rougher life we live. Sending love and letters two thousand miles back to the farm, wife and kids. And I did miners told by the face he keeps in the long cold lonely nights. And his woman's told by the tears she weeps in the long cold lonely nights. A wage slave fights a losing cause. It's a sad tale, but still so. The office men will make damn sure they've got a better go. And the unions say, blast just once a day. It's a crime if you do more. So we find ourselves an outlaw mine, and we're blasting three and four. And I've been miners told by the face he keeps in the long, cold, lonely nights. And his woman's told by the tears she weeps in long, cold, lonely nights. We looked all over Saskatchewan to find a place where the sun don't shine. Our last note came in the office of the Esther Hazy Potash Mine. Now they sure don't like the hard rock types cause we're a rough and tumble crew. So we hit the great northwest again a man does what he must do after a blast nothing could be done for, for about 20 minutes or more until the gas from the explosion had cleared then the rock from the explosion would have to be mucked or scooped out by a scoop tram a wheeled vehicle with a bucket on the front one of the scoop tram drivers was named Montgomery, Bill Montgomery. This song is called Bill's Match. East of Vermilion, just south of the Buffalo Hills, his Christian name was William. They called him Buffalo Bill. I never knew a more fearless man. Well, I never will. I never knew a more fearless man. Well, I never will. A boy in North Alberta spent his summers baling hay. At 16, he went to Manitoba to help to get the pipeline laid. The men would rough it up just for thrills when a new man came to the crew. All they had to do was take a look at Bill to have better things to do. East of Vermilion, just south of the Buffalo Hills, his Christian name was William. They called him Buffalo Bill. I never knew a more fearless man. Well, I never will. I never knew a more fearless man. Well, I never will. Down near the Arctic Circle, driving scoop in a silver mine, he worked 12 hours, seven days a week, four months and more at a time. One night a miner on a ladder got gas tied on with a light cord rope. Bill just pulled him up on his back right to the silver stoke. East of Vermilion, just south of the Buffalo Hills. His Christian name was William. They called him Buffalo Bill. I never knew a more fearless man. Well, I never will. I never knew a more fearless man. Well, I never will. The cook was a mean alcoholic and an ex-sergeant major, too. He stopped the coffee going to the dry for the miners when the shift was through. Bill had a chat with him at supper and got the coffee sent along. He started in, keep smiling, cookie, cause you won't be smiling long. East of Vermilion, just south of the Buffalo Hills, his Christian name was William. They called him Buffalo Bill. I never knew a more fearless man. Well, I never will. I never knew a more fearless man. Well, I never will. Now Bill was set to get married to a nurse from Vagerville. 
He said he'd stay north till the day before. She said, well, let's call it off, Bill. He couldn't sleep, eat, or concentrate. We knew Bill had met his match. When he said, well, so long, fellas, I got a plane to catch. East of Vermilion, just south of the Buffalo Hills, his Christian name was William. They called him Buffalo Bill. I never knew a more fearless man. Well, I never will. But no one in the land's more fearless than that nurse from Vagerville. After Christmas, a convoy of trucks, snowplows, and cats would start out from Yellowknife to plow a road. They would arrive in Terra in early February. Then they would leave their cargo and head back down the 280-mile road they had just made. One time, a trucker brought his girlfriend along for the ride. I remember men walking down to the dry, the building that housed the machine shop, the warehouse, the garage, and a change room, just to catch a glimpse of her. Only one other time was there a woman at the mine when I was there. An employee had died by sobering up too quickly, or not quickly enough, after coming back to the mine. A doctor and nurse flew in to take the body out. They had lunch in the cafeteria. The nurse, an elderly woman, was manly in demeanor, but I can remember looking at the man sitting across from me in the dining hall and thinking how unkept, unkempt he was, something I'd never thought about anybody up there in a long while. And just, it was just because a woman was present. At one time during the winter, a family of Martins was living under the back porch of the cook shack. Apparently one day, a baby Martin had managed to get inside the cook shack and made quite a mess before getting thrown out. That summer, a man, this man had traveled from Australia as a stowaway and had worked in the kitchen during the winter, was awakened by a half-grown Martin staring him in the face from the lamp table next to the bed. The former cook's helper gave out a yell, scaring the animal away. He realized, and realized the situation and ran after the Martin, calling out, Dino, Dino! Shortly after that, on a rare Sunday off, the government uh, started to make the company give miners and workers the Sunday off. And, and so the miners were sitting around outside on a Sunday afternoon, and a young Martin came walking through the camp, oblivious to the men sitting around. A pack of Arctic wolves hung out by the garbage dump. As Christmas had approached, a miner tried to scare me with talk about the wolves because I was going to be working alone in the mine over the holidays. A skeleton crew of 12 stayed behind to maintain the site. My chief responsibility on my shift was to keep the pumps running. The first day after the miners left, the wolves must have noticed the difference in the volume of garbage as one walked right through the camp. For three straight nights, there were fresh tracks outside the portal door when I came up to have a coffee break with the two men, John and Matt, maintaining the dry and mill. John would regale me with stories of his days as a beachcomber on the Yucatan Peninsula, living off turtle eggs, bananas, and any proceeds that came his way from smugglers who might land a boat nearby and need a hand. Matt was one of two brothers from Ireland who never could convey to anybody in their homeland that when they were in Terra, the nearest town was 280 miles away. And that is because the Dene people who lived in the area did not have permanent settlements at the time. Now, there are permanent Dene settlements at Ray Edzo, Laclamart, and Gamiti in between the mine and Yellowknife, for instance. Anyway, being somewhat concerned about the wolves, but having read Never Cry Wolf by Mark Farley Mowat, after that third night of the wolf coming to the portal, that next night I urinated outside the portal entrance to mark out my territory. And that's what Farley Mowat had done in his book Never Cry Wolf. That night at midnight, there were fresh tracks right into the entrance and right up to the door. The wolf, who obviously had never read Mowat, had been there right at midnight and we would have met if I hadn't been late coming up. The wolf had had another encounter on the way. And this is Lobo Hobo Kelly. Lobo Hobo Kelly out on the prowl tonight. Tracks will follow dead in line, left in front of right. He stands about four feet high. He's mostly brown and gray. 
And he met Matt outside to dry just the other day. And he sings to the moon, and I sing out of tune. And he longs for his partner like I long for you. The first time you will see him may send shivers down your spine. But as I say, his life's lonely, just like yours and just like mine. He stared at Matt a minute or so and quickly turned away. And there was something understood, but just what it's hard to say. And he sings to the moon and I sing out of tune. And he longs for his partner like I long for you. It got colder after that, and there were no more wolf tracks outside the portal. The rest of the men came back after New Year's. Suddenly it seemed crowded. Coming after, up after shift one night and seeing an adult and a pup playing in the snow on a tailings pond, I realized I was no longer afraid of the wolves. However, I never lost respect of the fact that they were wild. They never bothered any of the men, but they did have the chief mechanic's dog for lunch one day. There were other dangers at the mine. This song is called The Way That Things Take You. Last night he took the second lesson in a mining rescue course. He worked all day, he rid the night away, he was tired and out of sorts. He jumped upon the scoop tram and he pushed her down the decline. Before he knew, away she flew, crashing down the mine. But don't get tired in that scoop tram, because it don't run on track. Jimmy Hughes is airborne now with a broken back. And I've heard it said so many times, it even might be true. It's just the way that you take things, the way that things take you. Now, George, teacher said, you got a man hurt in a stope. Would you try to get him down or would you give up hope? Says George, I'd climb up after him, sing a little song, stick a J-bolt up his asshole first and you come along. But don't get tired in that scoop tram because it don't run on track. Jimmy Hughes is airborne now with the broken back and I've heard it said so many times it even might be true. It's just the way that you take things, the way that things take you. Now Don came back to the mine after another three-month tear, and he caught the plane in Edmonton for the lake they call Great Bear. But he must have left the bars too late, got on the plane too soon. When he got down to the river dock, he fell off the plane's pontoon. But don't get tired in that scoop trap, because it don't run on track. Jimmy Hughes is airborne now with a broken back, and I've heard it said so many times, it even might be true. It's just the way that you take things, the way that things take you. Nolan Boss was the director of mine safety and rescue training for the Northwest Territories. He had come to the mine for a couple of weeks to do a course. One evening, he talked to me about his life. And this is a different life. It's a different life in yellow knife. There's buildings with 10 floors and more. And society and piety coming further north. In 52, I was much like you. I found what I'd be saying again, and it's sad to see it had to be a dying song of you. And it hurts to hear the new folk talk of the poor, hard-working men and how it would be exciting to live like that again. But you're still young, your song's unsung, new dreams stream where others scheme, and the north to you is something new and something you'll become. It's a different life in yellow knife. There's buildings with 10 floors and more and society and piety coming further north. 